let's start with this. What what impresses me, and I in doing my research, I was able to delve deep and in, into your world again and get to listen to your voice plenty. Um, and what always impresses me is this kind of awareness that you have. You have a very deep and open awareness of a lot of situations and part of that like a large part of that is your intentionality with language I think or it 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 creates it um in light of that can you tell me how many languages you speak yeah I speak technically three languages so it's Spanish English and Swedish although I grew up in Spain and uh, specifically in in the region of Valencia so uh, I would hear, hear Valencian uh, on TV and at school and uh, also Catalan because that's what was uh, on TV when, when I was watching cartoons. So that's always been there. And then my, my, my dad speaks uh, French and German. So uh, hearing French and German also influenced uh, my relationship to languages. What's it like growing up as a kid in a multilingual family? Well, when you're a kid in that situation, it's normal. But uh, as I've grown older, I realize how much color comes from that. And one of those uh, aspects of growing up in a, in a multi-language uh, uh, household is, is that when you hear the language that your parents speak outside of your home, immediately you feel like you're home. So if I'm here in the U.S. and I hear somebody speaking Swedish, immediately I feel like I'm brought home to when I was a kid and uh, living with my parents. If I am in Spain and I hear somebody speaking English, specifically with a, an American accent, I I immediately feel like, oh yeah, that's that's also home, but it's in a different place, and uh, it can transport you. And it's very powerful to uh, to have access to that just through language. Are there any real positives that come from, like, can you describe situations differently? Can you find different meanings or um, see things differently through different lenses of language? 100%. Uh, each language has a different way of um, adding a little texture to that which you're describing. So, for example, in our household, I speak Swedish with my parents. I speak Spanish with my brothers and I speak English with my older sister. Okay. And when we're all together, although we speak Swedish, we mix English, Spanish and Swedish together so that we can uh, be more precise in the way that we're sharing. Sometimes it's a, it's a question of, of having access to words uh, quickly, but another time and uh, on other occasions, what it is, it's, um, it's being able to uh, describe something in a way that only that specific language can. And uh, I think this is something that applies to everything, uh, not only the, the code that we use to express ourselves, but also uh, the way that we present ourselves in the world. There are so many ways of doing that. So our, our bodies are a language, our way of thinking is a language, uh, our relationships and the way that those relationships are unfold our language. And when you start to see the, the richness that exists there, um, you start to see the world a little bit different. You start to experience the world a little different. I, I heard this quite a while ago that to possess, uh, to, to speak another language is to possess another soul. And I think it gives you a different perspective on, on the world. Like I am incredibly um, inefficient with my French. But like just living out in France for a while, it just gave me that extra little bit of like, oh, I can I can see this slightly differently now. Did it ever cause trouble for you speaking different languages? Yeah, I think it did. I've always felt like I was incomplete in my ability to express myself. Either I was missing words or I didn't know all the words. Um so it's, it's felt limited, but as I've grown older, I've realized that that limitation is simply uh, my understanding of language spread amongst the different ones that I know. Something you said earlier was about this precision that different languages give you. Why is it, well, why do you feel it's so important for you to be precise with your words? Because every moment is very unique. Mm -hmm. And uniqueness requires you to connect in a very unique way. 
And when you are connecting with something and uh, engaging with it, communicating with it, it's important that you are as unique in your communication and your expression as the moment is. And when you can do that, what ends up happening is that you are uh, fully engaged in that moment. You are fully connected to that moment. There is no past. There's no future. There's just this moment right here. And this is what in performance expresses itself as a, a flow state or uh, this sense of being able to do anything. Uh, it feels like effortless, effortless. Lovely, lovely. Um, one of the, again, like digging into this awareness and going down the, the lane of language and, and utilizing words properly, that you've spoken before about journaling and bringing about a journaling practice i think when you're pretty young like why did why did you start this well we had a sports psychologist that supported us and uh, they would encourage to keep a journal at least of our practices and specifically to start to add some color to it uh, sharing uh, what the experience felt like uh, uh, what you could have done better uh, what went well uh, what you're excited about just trying to add a little color, some emotional language to the prescription that you're following. And uh, I was too lazy <laughs> to, to keep a journal. I thought I was already doing enough work. I was like, why, why do I have to go over this again? Uh, and uh, that's something that I, I kind of dismissed when I was in gymnastics, but um, was always there. Uh, when I when I was studying uh, in school, I realized that I always kept notes on the side, and it was the notes that allowed me to process. I also realized that my my mother uh, every morning when I would wake up would sit in the kitchen and she was writing in a little notebook. Sometimes it was recipes, sometimes it was a to do list, sometimes it was just thoughts. And um, it started to dawn on me uh, later in life, especially when I got married where I started to live with Tanya and uh, I, I uh, was, get, was getting in trouble for uh, having all these notes everywhere, just loose pieces of paper where I was uh, writing stuff down or in, in, the, in the shower as I was taking a shower on the glass window, I would write things uh, as they were coming up for me. And what, what journaling really was right there was bringing out ideas that were coming up visually, images, uh, a vision and trying to translate that into uh, a code that uh, I could remember and I could also translate and uh, bring to whatever it is that I was creating. And not to mention the time where you and I were working together, you were encouraging me heavily to uh, have a journaling practice. So it's always been there. It's something that has always um, come back to uh, be a part of the foundation of what I could call uh, a practice of awareness and um, communication. Yeah. yeah. Well, do you remember your um, sports psychologist name when you're, when you're doing gymnastics? Do you remember no. what it's like to work under? Like, I guess you're pretty young. I can't, I can't remember her name, but I was, I was talking about her just two days ago. Uh, we currently have a roommate and he happens to be an Olympic gymnast. And I was, I was, tell, I was telling him about my experience with uh, my sports psychologist and how terrible I was as a, as a client, <laughs> but I, I can't remember her name. What do you think your sports psych was trying to get from you? What do you think she was trying to encourage? I think what she was trying to encourage was practice that extended beyond the gym, mm -hmm. meaning that it wasn't just about learning the skills. It wasn't about uh, going through the progression to win a competition, but realizing that everything that we were working on there uh, could be uh, further enhanced outside just by becoming aware of how we were engaging in our practice. And I also think one of the things that um, she was really working on with us was uh, getting us where we wanted to go faster, uh, more effectively, and um, emotionally um, whole. What have you found 
salient in your journaling like is there anything you watch out for obviously you're, you're fairly adept at it you've worked at it for quite a long time you've developed some proficiency in it so like is there anything that you find useful to watch out for um well one thing that i i do uh really watch out for is trying to control what i'm writing okay tell me more yeah so for example, if I, let's say I have a plan that I want to execute on and uh, I'm ready to uh, move forward with it, it's easy for me to turn my journaling into a planning to plan uh, session. And in, in, in uh, trying to plan to plan, meaning getting caught in that which you're executing on, uh, the creative juices stop flowing. So what I allow myself to do uh, every single time is, is to s just express myself, with, whether it's uh, drawing something or uh, writing a few words that are, are coming up, or maybe I read something and I've, I felt inspired by it, or... Um, I'm, I'm maybe journaling about something that has nothing to do with uh, what is on my mind. Um, it, it can even be uh, remembering a dream. Cool. You are, I, I would say, very high in trait openness, like creativity dimension of the big five personality. I think you, like, from knowing you as much as I know you and also seeing what you create, like, you're an entrepreneur you're an athlete, you're a coach, like you connect with people, you understand this openness. Part of that is being able to, no, part of the gift of that is that you get free ideas almost compared to everyone else. Like you can generate more, you create more. Part of the, the kind of the double-edged sword there is that you, it's occasionally difficult to channel those ideas. How do you, uh, I'm, I'm assuming there's other things aside from journaling as well, but how do you use journaling to channel those ideas to find, to sort the wheat from the chaff? I'll tell you right now. Here we go. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if you can see, yeah, but my magic. I, <laughs> okay. So I have, I have, this is something that I, I, I journaled about uh, yesterday, but basically I allow my, um, the, whatever visions come up, whatever I'm creatively inclined to uh, want to express in this moment. And, and then I, I, I think about it as an ecosystem. And I think about where does this idea that seems to not have anything to do with my goal, where would it fit in? How would it support? How would it assist? And then I start to draw uh, lines and I and I start to think about where does the uh, flux of resources go and come from and can this be included in some way whether it's a principle a value or potentially uh, a functional asset and this is where funneling comes into play how can you funnel the creativity towards moving yourself closer to the goal and uh, a lot of times where I start to anchor is in purpose. And I start to think, okay, what is my overarching purpose within my current performance, within my current practice? What is the purpose in relationship to what is coming up creatively? Is there a link? If there is a link, bring it in. If there is no uh, space for it to fit in, then it will have to wait until there is enough space, until there is more bandwidth. But at least it's there. And once it's recorded, you can always remember it. Nice. This is going to be so helpful to people to listen to as well, because what you essentially got through your purpose is a clear vision of success for you in terms of the way to act in every single moment. And that is almost acting like a filter of available options. It's like, we come up with loads of ideas, probably 90% of them are crap. So being able to filter them to like down to that 10% is, is really, really cool. I love that you're mm -hmm. doing that. What, what challenges are you facing when you, um, when you come around to journal? Do you often forget to do it? Do you find a resistance to it? Do you have times when you don't feel like it? Do you have times where you don't see the benefit in it? It's such a habit that it, it happens every day in some form. Uh, but challenges that I, I, I face are 
uh, more so staying on track. It's my creative mind says, hey, why don't you just look at this other thing? It's way more interesting right now. And, and the challenge is always to come back to uh, the, the focus of the month or the focus of the quarter or the focus of the year. And if I, if I can con continue to anchor, I know that my journaling practice is uh, producing results. So that's, that's the challenge is to remember uh, what, I, what I originally set out to do. Okay, so again, it's that kind of channeling that creativity, channeling the um, potentially disruptive nature of creativity and mm -hmm. make sure it's focused in one pursuit. Because one, one thing that people often say is like, okay, I'm creative, so I can't be disciplined. Or they, it's, a, it's a belief that comes out like that. Um, but you're proving that you can be both. You can mm -hmm. be like focused, intentional, deliberate with your actions and also generate ideas and be free that's awesome um was there a time well actually you've said there was already when journaling wasn't something that you enjoyed or it wasn't something that you utilized when and if so when did that become something that became habitual became something that you relied upon well in thinking about it right now i think when i started traveling for work what was that, 13, 14 years ago? Um, that's when it became a habit. And it started happening while I was having breakfast before uh, teaching a seminar. And the reason was <laughs> because I would attend a lot of these uh, seminars as, as the teacher <laughs> and I wasn't very prepared. So I was, um, I was uh, coming up with the ideas on the spot uh, hours before the start. And that was happening during breakfast. And I caught myself in the habit of every time I sat down to have a little coffee in the morning or to eat something that I, I, I would feel very confident when I put pen to paper. And because I'm a very visual person, I could create these uh, beautiful trees with ideas that I could um, get a picture of imprinted in my brain that later on when I had to speak about it, I could pull and uh, pull from and navigate uh, and, and connect dots, uh, not only for myself, but for the people that I was working with on that day. Cool. That's really nice. Um, what was the, you know, what was the biggest challenge you faced then in, in terms of making your journaling useful? I mean, it was very useful. I just didn't know it was useful. I wasn't aware of how useful it was. So it, 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 it was one of those things that I only understood in retrospect. I thought I was doing it because I was, I was uh, panicking and I had to come up with an idea to share. But in reality, what I was doing was uh, translating that which already lived in me in a way that became clear and was on paper and recorded that you could look at, you could uh, go back and it, it remained the same. It was constant. It served as a foundation. And it was, um, it was that which was immovable within my own movement. Uh, so to speak, very meta, but uh, that's what it was. It, it just gave me the the anchor, the foundation, the contrast. Um, but I didn't know that that's what I was doing. It's often that you start journaling practice and you don't see the utility in it, um, especially when it's something that is new to you. Because like not everyone has obviously started had the environment around them which it facilitates journaling, which facilitates writing down ideas or even expressing emotion. So sometimes we learn to filter it apart. Um, and obviously you've learned to see it and also, again, like identify what's important and let the rest slide. Part of what is important, I think, is the emotions and well, the mental emotional state, our subjective experience. How do you stay aware of your mental emotional state on a daily basis and what you can look for well it's it's very prevalent in me i'm, I'm a very emotional guy <laughs> so i'm always like oh i'm feeling this and i need to tell you right now so for me <laughs> for me that's not a problem uh it's always present but what i do do with my emotions especially in in my journaling practice is um i try to place myself 
and I say, okay, how, how activated do I feel right now? Do I feel very activated or do I feel kind of low energy? How uh, pleasant does this feel right now? And this is kind of based on uh, the valence arousal model uh, where you can, you can place yourself uh, within in these, these uh, high, high arousal states or low arousal states, uh, high pleasant uh, states or, or low uh, pleasant states. And simply by placing myself on a map, which is completely arbitrary because emotions are so much more complex and multi-layered, that once again gives me an anchor. And, and I think it comes down to choice. You choose, how do I think I'm feeling right now? And then when you start to process how you're th feeling in that moment, you realize that you feel different. And then uh, you start to wonder, wait, was I feeling a certain way when I told myself how I was feeling? Or um, uh, was I actually feeling how I feel now that I processed the original thought of feeling? And, and this, is, this is something that is very confusing for people, but when you get used to it, you realize that, oh, whatever I'm feeling right now is simply in passing. What is it trying to show me? What is it telling me? And how can I um, work with this to move in the direction that I want to move? And this is uh, exciting, if you ask me. That there is gold. You're, you're noticing the transitory nature of emotion and also your standing point which is backward from emotion because you like so many people are getting so wrapped up in i am my emotion i am angry i am sad i am stressed as opposed mm -hmm. to i feel and like identifying the i in that and coming back and seeing it that's going to be useful for so many athletes especially i am exhausted i am struggling with this <laughs> like that kind of thing yeah and coaches too um a big part of awareness and something that us 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 uh, so always uses the analogy of, if you remember back to talking about free nature and bound nature with me, the, the struggle or the, the challenge with, with free nature and that, that place of flow and that place of creativity is once you find it staying there. And I feel like there's a very strong analogy or metaphor with a handstand or any active balance. And also your, background as a gymnast you are taught to i suppose i'm rubbish at handstand so that's just let's get that in there. Um, <laughs> the you're taught to become deeply aware of where you are right now and i suppose the difference between a great a, an average handstand like mine and a good handstand like yours is that ability to perceive the difference in Okay, am I shifting to my heels, then my hands to my tips, my fingers to the left, the right, that kind of stuff. What's it like to hold, even though I've just kind of traipsed all over this great question, and what's <laughs> it like to hold a great hand sound? What's like from your point of view, what does that feel like? Well, I don't know because I'm still in the pursuit. So I, I, I couldn't tell you, but I can tell you that the pursuit or the uh, practice of it feels I'm pausing here because I'm, I'm trying to really um, think about what it feels like. Yeah, it feels like you belong. Like this is supposed to be like this. And um, from the outside, maybe somebody looking, looking in is thinking, oh, wow, that's pretty impressive that you can hold that position that seems so uncommon. But when you're actually doing it, it feels really normal, very common. And you realize that this, this notion of what is common or uncommon is simply that. It's simply a perception. And when you realize that uh, something like holding a handstand, which may seem uncommon, is common for you, the sense of belonging, like it's right, like you, you're supposed to be here doing this, uh, is really empowering. And that empowering, although subtle in nature when it translates uh, is very powerful uh, as it it's, it's serves as this um, undercurrent that supports anything that you want to do. In other words, if, um, if I have to be uh, mentally focused on a task outside of my handstand practice, knowing that I can do it in one area of my life allows me to do it in another. 
you tell me for more about yeah for example i mean i one of the things that i don't like to do is i don't like to um uh, go through my uh, financial books. I, I, I get, I get uh, nervous looking at all the items. Mm -hmm. But I know that I have the capacity to focus in doing a handstand. So why can't I focus on these items the same way? And when I put myself in that state, all of a sudden I'm like, oh, this is actually kind of enjoyable. And I'm kind of good at it. And that is very empowering because what it really is doing is it's producing transferable skills that go beyond the mechanical expression. It becomes part of uh, the way that you think and the way that you feel in association with the thoughts and the narrative that you have uh, in relationship to whatever it is that you're doing. And this is where practice uh, becomes the true nature of, of uh, development. What things have you previously had to become aware of? And when it comes down to the, that mental, emotional state that have been disruptive to let's start with your physical training. I've always thought that um, discomfort um, was bad because it would bring up uh, negative emotions for me. And something that I've had to do is, is translate that discomfort into um producing meaningful results as creative as I am, or as, uh, as emotional I can be, or as, um, just uh, sensitive and, and, and willing to allow things to flow. I have a, I have a deep need for, uh, producing results for being pragmatic, being practical. So, uh, working with discomfort has been really uh, important to me uh, because it used to bring up negativity, a negative narrative. What did but that now? Sound? Yeah. Yeah. What did but that experience sound like? It sounds like you suck. Uh, why are you doing this? This is stupid. Who cares? Um, why would you put yourself through this? You could just be doing something else right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it, it becomes a, 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 a never ending stream of self criticism and uh, judgment. Yeah, it's so useful for people to hear that. Because like most people would think that because they are at a kind of maybe a different level from you, they would think that you'd be impervious to that. And you would be able to <laughs> separate it. But it's, it's knowing what to do with it, that makes the difference. Mm -hmm. And your relationship to going towards it's really important as well. Like what, what does your self talk sound like now? Or what reminders do you set yourself when that, because it's still going to come up, you're not going to like banish it. What, what, what do you do with that now? Mm. Well, I, I, let me share what's, what's happening at the moment. Uh, at the moment, I've, I, I, I had a plan um, going into the pandemic before the pandemic even broke out that plan was completely dismantled by the, the status of the world. And I put myself kind of on hold and I started thinking, well, let's see how things unfold. Let me just go with the flow. And as the flow took me places, I, I started to crystallize a new uh, idea, a new plan, a new vision. And as I've been going into this vision, it's requiring me to revisit parts of who I was and how I was, uh, especially 10 years ago, that I uh, don't admire. I, I, I didn't like. I um, was, was doing that un unconsciously. And, and this can be speaking in a certain way, um, uh, acting in a certain way in order to uh, promote my business uh, or um, engaging in uh, relationships that I didn't really care for. And now I'm having to revisit that. And as I'm revisiting those parts of who I was that got me to a place of success of producing results, now I'm having to uh, reframe, recreate the relationship with how I want to express myself in those areas because those areas are required for me to move towards my goal. And this is, this is creating a lot of dissonance. And this dissonance feels uh, negative. It feels heavy. It feels discouraging. But the more I allow myself to sit with those feelings, the more I'm able to see the truth. 
I'm able to see, wait a second, I was just trying to get a need met and I didn't have uh, the tools. So I used the tools that I was modeling from the people that were around me. Now with the experience that I currently have, how could I create a new expression in order to help me get my needs met? And that, although I don't know what it is exactly, I have a sense of it. What does it feel like? Wow, it feels easy. Oh, it feels positive. It feels fluid. It feels exciting. It feels, um, it, it feels like it's uh, moving me in the direction that I want to go in. Let me lean into that. Where can I find that? And I say to myself, show me. Show me how to do it. And when I tell myself that, when I, when I, uh, when I, when I ask myself to show me how to do it, it's, it begins to happen. And this is when you become a little bit more or original. This is when you start to present yourself in a more authentic way. And this is something that when you start to experience it, I'm even getting goosebumps right now because uh, just by sharing it with you, I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, that's exactly what it feels like, where it's like, who cares? Who cares? As long as it feels good to you and you're doing it without causing harm, then who cares? Move in that direction and allow it to show you the feedback that you need to make the adjustments. And that's, that's where I'm currently living. That's beautiful and such a challenge for so many people because we feel like we need to put up this facade because to fit in creates safety, the delusion of safety, I would say. Um, the authenticity that you're bringing out there is incredible. Um, have you always been that authentic? I don't think so. I, I mean, I, I have, but I haven't dared to express it. Even just now, I was even, um, you know, you have these moments where uh, you're able to witness what you're saying and how you're saying it, where I have to uh, allow myself to let go in order to not control what is coming out, because otherwise um, I'm, I'm limiting that authenticity. And there is a part of me that's kind of like, well, what are people going to think if I speak like this? What are people going to feel if I speak like this? Is this uh, causing me harm? Is this going to uh, negatively uh, um, impact my life? And these are the, the normal fears that I think that come with uh, opening yourself up to uh, that free, um, unlimited way of thinking and being. Yeah. yeah. Having an audacious, ambitious, exciting goal that challenges you, it is the opposite of fitting in. It's the opposite of conforming to what others expect of mm -hmm. you. But that is the path to self realization, to expanding your capacity and finding like breaking through your own limits um it's a scary thing to do though it's a vulnerable thing to do what's what's the does the resistance sound like to becoming vulnerable because i think that's gonna um again show people that it's scary yes but okay to feel that way mm -hmm. yeah i think there's some basic needs that I want to get met. Um, and there are times where being uh, yourself <laughs> may slow the, the meeting of those needs down. And, uh, and an example of this is, is uh, let's, let's say I, I'm, I'm talking about a new concept and I, I decide to start sharing it on social media, for example. To allow yourself to share it in your way, knowing that it's going to take longer for people to relate to it, uh, rather than going down the gimmicky uh, three-step process <laughs> that uh, most of us uh, use as, as a strategy for sharing online. This organic versus um, methodical, practical, or gimmicky even um, approach that this 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 separation that exists. Th this is the this is the uncoupling that that we have to kind of go through in order to to meet uh, what we're truly trying to communicate. And this may sound confusing to people, but it's it's as simple as simply say what is on your mind right now, even if it doesn't land. 
and then notice as you say it, how it lands on you. And if you get some feedback, how it lands on others and then make the adjustments without succumbing to uh, the language or the way that other people are using. When you can do that, then things start to happen. And this translates into our physical training. Uh, it translates into our relationships or anything that we do. But we have to do it at least in one area in order to be able to do it elsewhere. Yeah. You're having to risk not only offense if you're speaking, which is a scary thing to do. And I, I don't want to dive too far into the politics. Of, especially of, of now. That. Yeah, especially now. Um, but you're risking failure and social rejection as well and not only for coaches but for athletes too that is the thing that's holding so many of us back is there a time when you've I don't want to use the word succumb to this but had that kind of fear of standing out become a problem for you yeah I think there have been times where I've been scared to express myself fully because I was supposed to be uh, under somebody or uh, in full alignment with an organization or I'm supposed to do things uh, by the gymnastics code. For example, as I was doing gymnastics, uh, there's a code that tells you how to do things. If you do it by the code, then you're doing gymnastics well. If you don't do it by the code, then you're not doing gymnastics well. So being able to separate uh, from the, the current status quo of whatever your, your, your life situation is, uh, that, that has been something I've experienced uh, several times. And um, there's a part of me that regrets not taking that, that, that leap. Uh, but there's another part of me that knows that I had to experience it in order to become aware of it and now be able to let go and say, fuck it. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know if I can swear here, but that's, uh, that's how it feels. Yeah. Yeah. That's, again, it's, it's this, that you have this very, compassionate relationship with your former self and your past self and that is such an important part for people to generate because most people or a lot of people that we deal with particularly but like most people I think that you encounter have this kind of loathing of who they were because it's not who they are now or they know now know better but it's that kind of Oh, I was doing the best I possibly could at the time with all the information I had with my past experiences with whatever history created my genetics and evolution all that kind of stuff it created me at that moment and I was doing all I possibly could do right now um so to hear that compassion that you have for yourself back then is awesome it's really cool to hear so yeah hats off to you that's awesome because sometimes I'm pretty critical of that that person um of course it, it, yeah <laughs> I'm like oh can't believe you said that, uh, but whatever. <laughs> he's he's dead. He's not, he's not around anymore. But yeah. I'm so glad he existed. He got you here. Yeah. And you who knows what I'm saying now? Exactly. You wouldn't be where you are now without those moments. That's the paradox of it. Without going wrong, you wouldn't have these opportunities that you do now. Exactly. I think when I when I was putting together this conversation or kind of notes to this, I was like thinking about significant points in your life. And one of those points where I think you lent into authenticity was the, was the transition out of gymnastics world into where you are now and the steps in between to kind of set the scene for everyone. And to kind of, I know you've spoken about this at length and we'll kind of, we'll go on the slightly different angle at it. I think, um, can you just say where you were, in that kind of build up to that move away um and obviously as, as much or as little as you're you're willing to share don't need to say anything you don't want to say yeah let's see how we can summarize this in a way that that makes sense um gymnastics wad was amazing and i'm so glad i did it and there's a part of me that wishes i had continued to do it but i just didn't have the tools and the understanding and the ability to uh carry it forward i simply couldn't do it with who I was back then. And I knew that in order for me to transcend and, and get to the next level, I had to cut ties. And, and I, I was kind of like a teenager saying, screw it. 
I'm leaving the household. I know exactly what to do. <laughs> and then arriving outside and be like, oh, damn, this really sucks. This is much harder than what I was doing before. I just want to go home. Uh, but now I have to get this experience in order to come back. Um, so in, in, in other words, gymnastics wad was ripe for the time. It was, it was uh, giving people exactly what they wanted in a way that was um, good enough to push the limits of the current uh, status of, of CrossFit at the time. And, uh, and that may be transcending into other areas of fitness. But it was incomplete. It was incomplete because it was purely mechanical. And although I, I used words in my description that brought up some uh, emotional and mental aspects of the development, it was uh, not enough to penetrate the, the audience. Thankfully, during my seminars, I was able to penetrate the audience with these ideas, with the, 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 the importance of mindset, the, the importance of emotional fitness in order to achieve the mechanical outcomes desired. And that's where the transition into freestyle uh, really happened. And uh, now being in a place where I am talking about uh, emotional fitness, uh, from the core and then building from, from there. What was that transition like? It was confusing. It was dark. It was very scary. It was, uh, very lonely. It was, uh, embarrassing. It was, um, It was also very uh, insightful. I, I learned a lot. It also brought a ton of responsibility because I had to take full ownership of my decisions and the actions and the results. It uh, brought a lot of clarity in terms of what I do want to do, even if it was only a few things. And it, um, we, have a tr we have a train passing by. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> we had a plane going past earlier, so it's all good. There you go. Um, yeah, it brought a lot of clarity in terms of what I wanted to do. And being able to lean into what I wanted to do gave me just enough uh, footing to, to move forward. And th that's what it felt like, uh, a roller coaster. So part of that shift in the kind of external or the physical levels is a shift in letting go of identity and letting go of like this stable, predictable, if I act in line with X, then I become Y, then I get Y as a response. And letting go of that is scary. Did it feel like there was much on the line at the time? Yeah, everything, it felt like everything was, was on the line. Uh, but now looking back, what was on the line in my mind was my reputation. And I, and I, and I thought my reputation is everything, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> which, which is funny now, uh, look, looking back, um, because what, what is everything to me is being 100% transparent, honest, truthful with myself in a way that allows me to, uh, see others and is open enough to allow others to see me and thus be able to connect. And in that process, be able to deploy my strengths, which are to uh, assist people in moving in the direction that they need and ultimately desire. What was the initial response to that? Like what, what was the immediate kind of next after the, actually take me to the decision. Like, was there a moment that you'd, do you remember making that decision? Yeah, I was, I was sitting on a plane flying back from Las Vegas. Uh, I had just shot all the pictures for my book. And I was sitting next to my co-author. And I looked over at him and I said, um, Tony, I think I need to shut this down and separate from my old business partner. This is not who I want to be. This is not where I want to be. And um, it's a big risk but I think I just need to do it. And he said, whatever you do, I support you. And hearing him say that was enough 
to um, get me going. Then, of course, I didn't realize how much uh, had happened over the five years that I had been developing Gymnastics Wad and how many roots had grown and all the relationships that existed and uh, all the small steps that I took that I was unaware of. I had to peel back all of that and rinse all of that out. And it took many years to, to do that. And it was, uh, it was a very painful process. And then uh, <laughs> I realized I could have done it completely different uh, years later, and I would have had the same outcome, but with less pain. But I'm glad I went through the, the painful process because I wouldn't have the awareness that I have now. What would have happened if you didn't change path? Well, I would probably um, be sitting on um, probably a, a little bit more money. I would have um, uh, a lot more emails coming in with people asking me to collaborate. Uh, I would have um, uh, less time available because I would be so busy uh, chasing the next thing. Um, and I would probably be absolutely miserable because I wouldn't, I wouldn't be uh, fully myself in every aspect of my life. Yeah. That's the value of authenticity, right? Yeah. It feels but, when you're not being authentic, it feels kind of icky. It feels, it like feels terrible. I don't want anybody to see it. I've always said, imagine your life put on display for the world to see. If there's anything that when it's, when it's seen by others makes you feel a little uncomfortable, then you know that that's what you need to work on. Yeah. If 80 um, of, yeah, if 80% of my life was, was my work or is my work because I love working and I'm not being fully authentic, fully myself in that, that place, then 80, 90% of my life feels icky i don't want that yeah it's when we start to pursue what's expedient and like this is the quickest route to get me to where i like think i want to be or to achieve the outcome as opposed to um showing what is truly resonates with us and like and that requires again to bring back that awareness and why i, I want to, to invite you on as a guest and is just that is that settling that that observation of yourself that you maybe build up through a physical practice first, but then you can incorporate into journaling, meditation, any kind of process, just watching yourself in day-to-day -day life. And that concept is enough to bring about that balance, but that you're an exceptional example of it. I, I really mean that you, you do like from, from what I can see anyway, um, you're an exceptional example of it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. It's something that I, I spend a lot of time in and um, maybe when, when, when I go uh, and my, my life comes to an end in this form, it carries uh, in, in, in some sort of way. And this is where uh, there are two seeds that I believe are important to, to plant and it's the awareness of subtlety and it's the awareness of uh, increments. And, and subtlety being that just light sense of something different, that something's there. And the increment being the impact that that subtlety, that subtle feeling uh, makes. And when you can nurture that over time, seeing the, the, the effect, the influence uh, that it has, um, it's very meaningful to me. Yeah, I can see that. And I think one of the, it, I think this seems like a big left turn, but it is related. I think the situation you're in now as a, as a parent and a grandparent must present a whole host of challenging experiences where awareness is, um, is the solution to, actually, I was thinking about a quote that you Bought apart and uh, bought up in in freestyle and like the idea that the goal is to chase the best way not the most familiar way and i feel that it's it must be easy with it must be easy to become a reactionary parent 
and not a conscious one and a reactionary grandparent and not a conscious one how are you approaching those challenging situations and what do you need to stay aware of Mm. well as i dive into it maybe this could segue um somebody was was here the other day working on the house and um uh said oh congratulations you became grandparents and uh, she shared a quote with us which was that you don't learn how to become a son or a daughter until you become a parent you don't learn how to become a parent until become you become a grandparent and what she was basically saying is that you need the the awareness of the experience in order to understand how to better be who you need to be in that role to be conscious of what that role is but when you're in it it's inevitable to be reactionary to be reflexive in the way that you do things for example when the baby is crying here i immediately go into panic mode okay we need to change the diaper get you the you know like we need to get you the the bottle uh we need to entertain you um and my wife is the opposite she's like just let him do the thing until we figure out what it is that he needs and then we'll 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 get him that but there's a balance there uh i think it's important to be reflexive uh, but also be effective in, in being reflexive. Uh, and I think it's also good to be responsive, but to not allow your response to be so delayed that you miss the mark. Again, that awareness. Yeah, that, that awareness. And this is something that you're, sometimes you succeed and sometimes you uh, completely fail. And it's, it's allowing it to, to exist that way and when, when you do that, I think what ends up happening is that, uh, especially with a baby, a baby changes every single day. You're like, whoa, that's a new thing. So you're riding these very fast, uh, short waves. And, and being reactionary in that, in that case is valuable. Um, but as, as you learn the basic patterns, you start to see, oh, here are bigger waves and they come in different sets. And now I can see them coming, thus I'm aware. And I know, oh, uh, nap time is soon coming. I know that he's gonna start getting a little fussy. Let me start prepping for the bottle and prepping for the this and putting them down and then making sure that we don't have anything in the way. And then all of a sudden that transition becomes really smooth. And I think it comes down to learning to live in transition, whether it's an acute transition or it's a progressive one. What are the conscious decisions that you've made about parenting and grandparenting that maybe maybe yeah you would have reinforced yourself if you if you were a kid Mm -hmm. um well basically is the main one is that this individual is is exactly that an individual i am simply a supporter of the individual and this individual is influenced by my behavior, by how I feel and how I think, because what this individual is doing is modeling uh, and learning to self-regulate through our relationship. So I need to become even more mindful of how I am self-regulating, how I am thinking, how I am feeling, especially around the baby. And uh, the service <laughs> that I provide uh, for, uh, you know, in terms of my care, that, that is um, just a sliver of the pie because keeping uh, a baby alive is relatively simple and easy to do. But uh, uh, creating an environment that is conducive for, for, for growth, uh, going beyond resilience and, um, and that also encourages individuality with a collective uh, uh, consciousness, meaning one that that is included in in the in the bigger picture. And that that is the the challenge. And I think that's what I'm I'm currently navigating. And then knowing that I'm the grandparent and um, the boy's uh, mother is the one that is technically uh, in charge when it comes to the bigger decisions. That's another thing to let go of. Oh, well, that's her choice. I wouldn't do it that way, but it's not my place. Letting go is a big one. That must be a tough one. That must be Ooh, a tough one. 
<laughs> Woo! <laughs> That's one where I'm like, oh, goodness. Okay, if you want to learn to let go, just do it this way. This is great. Um, so now is a real, a real a non sequitur uh, change. You spoke about visualizations as a kid, and I've heard you mention this a few times. Um, when did that start? That started very young, as 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 far back as I can remember. I always had these visions of how I wanted to execute on something, how I wanted something to feel. In fact, I had I, this uh, for whatever reason. This is coming up right now, but I had this uh, one vision that it wasn't even deliberate, but it was me. Uh, I was living in Spain as a kid. I was in grade school, and me leaving the country, going to a different country. I, I think it was the U.S. potentially or somewhere in Asia, and then being gone for uh, an extended period of time, and then coming back. And the coming back was kind of this like hero's journey. Uh, you went out and you discovered something, and you came back. And you were this completely new uh, person. And I used to have that uh, thought uh, very often. And um, it's strange to think about right now because I haven't thought about it in a while. It's something that I, I, I think happens uh, all the time in our lives. We, we are something. We behave in a certain way. We uh, live in a, in, a, in a certain environment. We, uh, we have certain habits. And then we depart from them and we go on this journey that when we go full circle and come back, there is this um, renewed sense of knowing. And that renewed sense of knowing is the inner knowing. And this inner knowing, our intuition being in line with uh, the reality that we live in, is what gives us that sense of um not righteousness necessarily, but like, yes, this is, this is exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. And it's really powerful. An example of this in, in, in training uh, is if you follow a certain method and you've been following it religiously to say, this is not fully serving me right now. I'm going to depart away from it. I'm going to explore some other things and then I'm going to return. And when I return that person who I am in my old way of doing things is going to have a greater level of understanding. And that greater level of understanding is that which gives you the edge to break uh, through to new levels of, of performance and, uh, and achievement and, and, and results. Nice. That's really nice. What's your daily practice like of uh, anything that is mindset orientated anything that puts you in the right place mentally mm. it changes a little bit uh, but there's uh, always journaling there's always meditation there's some breath work associated to it and uh, recently I have been having a hard time accessing certain emotions so I've had to um, aid myself with some music and uh, I, I'm not a music guy but I um, I play something that uh, can, can give me access to certain emotions. And right now, one of the emotions that I am seeking to live in is the one of uh, joy and um, uh, not aggressiveness. <laughs> it's more like uh, vigor, vigor. Yeah. Uh, I, I, oh, that, you know, I want that. Come on. Which I, I used to have but it softened so much because I had to process some other things. And now I want that back. I want that um, more aggressive side of me to come out, but to come out in a way that is um, expressed in drive uh, with deep compassion and awareness for um, the influence and um, uh, impact that it has on, on those around me. Yeah, that's a really tough balance and a nuanced balance to strike. The balance between assertiveness, like deliberacy, intentionality, and an element of aggression too. Aggression gets a bad rap today, but used effectively, it's it's a fantastic element of personality that we all have to like generate more of. And then fine tuning that with compassion, with softness. It's like the true image of a warrior. It's a very mm -hmm. difficult one to strike. Um, how? 
how do you find yourself um, again generating awareness of that is there anything you find yourself watching out for that means you're too far on one side of that balance well i i, I have a hard time being aggressive um already as it is because i i used to be pretty aggressive um growing up not not in a violent way but i was very uh you, you use the word really well assertive uh but i was um assertive uh but lacking compassion i was unable to uh see from uh from the, a place of uh emotional well-being for others and now that's that's what i'm i'm constantly aware of is when I pursue this inner sense of mm, I, I, I can do this, I want to do this, I'm, I'm going to do this, how, how is this um, assertiveness uh, impacting others? And if it's causing no harm, then I move forward. If I'm unaware whether it's causing harm or not, I ask as best as I can. Hey, how, how, what comes up for you when I do this or act this way? And if uh, I get some feedback that uh, is important to me, then I, I change my, my approach to my assertiveness and, and directness. Yeah. Again, risking vulnerability, like mm -hmm. risking offense, risking doing something which stands out, risking failing, risking personal hurt and hurt of others. It's, it's all a, it's all a risk and stepping into the unknown um and like in order to expand our experience of the known we have to step into the unknown and like that's again like it's a dangerous thing to do that's where hurts that's where um mishaps happen and yeah it's a it's a, it's a scary thing to do when you get that perfectly right sorry you're about to say something now no 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 yeah i'm i'm, I'm just i'm agreeing with what you're saying <laughs> is, is exactly right well, that's what I wanted just to hear you agree with me. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> just tell me you agree. <laughs> um, so when you get that balance right, when you're living on the edge between the known and the unknown, between chaos and order, um, you often find free nature flow like your best sporting experiences. So when what was your best sporting experience is there a moment you can recollect that is just like that was the epitome of of free nature and the expression of myself yeah i think it was um 1996 uh spanish championships uh in gymnastics and having failed on every single event uh and leading up to the final event and realizing that i had nothing to lose so i went for the easiest uh most simple um uh, routine i could possibly do and I did it so well that I uh, came in second and I got my first medal uh, on the national stage. And uh, the reason that was so impactful was when you can perform, express yourself, present as if you had nothing to lose and with no intention to cause harm, you will produce positive outcomes. And that is really powerful. And uh, this is something I have to remind myself of daily is whatever it is that I think I have to lose, it's probably not that. What did that performance feel like? Yeah, it, it felt effortless. It was so easy. It's something that I could do um, in the worst state of being. I could be angry. I could be tired. I could be uh, completely... Um, uh, unfocused and still be able to execute because it was just mechanically there it was in, in, ingrained in, in me it was it was like a, a simple warm-up um so it felt effortless and when you can perform uh in an effortless way and produce results that are ones that stand out uh, you all of a sudden start to feel like, whoa, there's something really powerful here. Uh, how can I lean into that? Do you remember any thoughts going through your mind at that time? Yeah, yeah I, I remember just thinking, screw it. Who cares? Mm -hmm. I'm and guessing then, that was before, like when you're making a decision. 
yeah yeah that's that's what it was but then uh d during it was um it was one of just oh all this takes is just doing and doing it is actually not as bad or hard or uh crazy as as you thought it was before you did it mm. Yeah, it's quite often, actually, if you were going to describe that state in one state, in one word, what word would you choose? The state of being able to just, just do. You know what it feels like? It feels like um, emptiness, mm -hmm. but not emptiness as the, the emptiness of, oh, I, I don't have anything here, but but rather the emptiness that you it's kind of like the from from Taoism. So if you if you read the Tao Te Ching, it's it's the woo. It's it's the emptiness. It's um, the the space in the cup is the function. When you have a room and you carve out uh, a, an opening on the wall, you create the window that lets the light in. That's what it feels like. It feels like the space that is empty. Uh, that has function. And I guess the only word that I can find uh, would be woo. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, it, again, another language to add to your repertoire. <laughs> yep. Uh, I, I, I don't speak Mandarin or Chinese. So it's, uh, yeah. You're I, making I, a good job. You got the important words. There you go. <laughs> I got the, I got those. Yeah, that is kind of, is this kind of emptiness, openness, freedom, space. And so many of us think that we've got to force ourselves into that position, but you found that through letting go mm -hmm. and surrendering as opposed mm -hmm. to construct again, like it's, again, it's that balance between assertiveness and, and freedom. Like that's, that's that balance that you found at that moment. And it's, it's like, I, more and more people need to hear what that feels like because it's not forced. It's not friction. It's mm -hmm. openness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Openness. I, I think that's, the, that's the word. Woo is the emptiness that is actually open and the openness is what brings the functionality in. And something that you just reminded me of is the only reason I was able to fully make that decision at that moment was because my brother who was watching me compete, ran down the bleachers, came down and said, Carl, whatever you do, stick it, stick the landing. And I thought to myself, damn, the vault that I'm going to do, I have stuck maybe once or twice in training. How am I going to stick it here? And that's when I told my coach, you know what? I'm not going to do that vault. I'm just going to do this other one. And he said, do whatever you want. You've had a shit competition. I said, okay, I'm just going to stick it then. So I went and I stuck the landing and, and there it was. Nice. nice. Yeah. So I anchored in, in what my brother had, had told me. Nice. That's really cool. What did the, what did the, the experience before that feel like up until that moment where you found that emptiness, openness, like what did the competition or the, the meat feel like? Absolute that? crap. Yeah, it felt it felt like absolute crap. And it was also um, difficult because my my coach had told me months prior to that competition, uh, that this competition was going to be uh, a bad one for me, because I had taken too much time off, and I wasn't going to have time to prepare. So he had already planted the seed that I wasn't going to be ready. Useful. Mm -hmm. Very useful. <laughs> <laughs> Good coaching. <laughs> Great coaching. Of course, he didn't do it on purpose. He he was he was being fully practical. But I, I realized that that planted a seed. It told me that you weren't going to be ready. So whatever was going to happen at that competition was going to be the product of uh, unpreparedness. And it was until that final meet. Do you? Um, I know it's a. Uh... A while ago, but do you remember what that like that emotional state was like? What the thoughts were like? Do you could you sum it up? But, but yeah, before those that freedom. Yeah, I, I let let's let's go all the way back to uh, the reason I decided to compete in this in this uh, competition, which was because I had just watched the Olympics, 1996 Atlanta. The American girls had just won, uh, won the, the gold with uh, this dramatic uh, sticking of the landing uh, on vault by Carrie Strug. 
And I decided I'm going to go and train again, and I'm going to compete uh, this fall in the national championships. So I went back to the gym, started training, and that's when my coach said, you're not going to be ready. I went to the competition, and I expressed myself in a way that uh, was unprepared, and it felt like um, the world and its judgment on me was correct. And it felt like I was small and insignificant and my excitement and um, uh, joy for gymnastics was, was never going to be uh, fully validated or fulfilled through uh, competition. So I had to find it somewhere else until I got to the last event and I was able to switch it around by being more simple and working on that which I, I had practiced that deeply and I felt confident engaging with and that being enough to make a positive impact. What were you trying to achieve before you got to that state? I think I was just trying to achieve feeling what it's like to um, arrive at a place that is um, considered uh, uh, the, the highest state of uh, mm. performance or achievement, um, that which says with your actions, you have uh, stood out enough that you've shifted uh, something. You've, you've moved the needle. You've made history. Um, I didn't know why I wanted that, but that's, that's what I was uh, pursuing uh, at that time. It's almost like that element of externality in there, mm -hmm. the view of others. So that's, that's interesting. Consider what creates a bound nature experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. And, and, and funny enough, I, I was never, it wasn't, it wasn't the extrinsic uh, motivation that was driving me, but in my vision, the extrinsic um, elements were heavily influencing my inner being, mm. my inner state. And that's something that I've had to shift around. How can I be the outside and the inside all at once and allow whatever extrinsic um, uh, factors to be a byproduct of who I am, who I truly am? Yeah, which is that openness, that woo, that, that freedom, that space that we've spoken about. Exactly. And it's, it's so challenging. And this is a conversation that if, if people are listening and feeling like, yeah, I can relate, I, I hear it, but how do I do it? Well, then this is where practice comes in. And you have to have an anchor and you have to have uh, uh, the space once again, to to dedicate to experiencing these feelings and to work with them and to realize that you can, you can change them, you can adapt them. And that when you change them, when you adapt them, they come with new thinking and new thinking comes with a new vision and new vision comes with new action and new action comes with new results and new results come with new feedback and thus produces this um, infinite uh, progression. Mm. Lovely, lovely, really nice place to end. I think, I think that's, that's awesome. Um, where can people find a bit more about you and where can people find a bit more about Freestyle um, Insider and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, right now, uh, freestyleconnection.com uh, continues to remain the uh, main place to find me and then all other social media platforms. And maybe by the time this is coming out, I am starting to get a little bit more active uh, on my channels and, and, and sharing a little bit more. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's where, where you can find me for now. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Carl. Yeah. Thank you.